Hello everyone, this is Direwolf20, and welcome to part 2 of my Thaumcraft 4 Mod Spotlight. Time to show you guys some of the more advanced and more interesting stuff that's available in Thaumcraft. Uh, last episode, part 1, I showed you guys how to do research, how to deal with basic wands, how to draw some energy out of the aura nodes, and all kinds of basic stuff like that. Also showed you the arcane crafting table and how to use that. This episode, we'll be going into more in-depth and complicated stuff, so you should have watched part 1 if you hadn't gone go back now and watch it because you're going to pretty much need to know everything that was covered in part one to understand part two and with that we're going to get started showing you guys all the cool stuff that thomcraft 4 offers in part two of this spotlight all right guys the first thing i want to cover for you in this spotlight is the crucible the crucible is a uh, another crafting mechanic and you're going to need to use this crucible for several things throughout thomcraft 4. Uh, it's really easy to make just place a cauldron on the ground and hit it with a wand not hard to do at all. The crucible is going to open up several bits of alchemy for you, and that's what the alchemy tab is all about. You're going to be able to make magic tallow, which is really easy to get, which gives you some really cool tallow candles. You can also get nitor and alimentum, which is a pretty nifty substance for use later on. You can also get yourself some gunpowder and some thaumium if you want, uh, which can be used to make all kinds of important and nifty stuff, like the thaumium tools and uh, a couple different other things, even some armor is available. Very nice. Uh, remember, Thaumium tools and armor um, have the same enchantability as gold, but more durability than gold has. So they're pretty much a better version of gold, and they're really good at getting enchanted. Cool? So that's uh, the Crucible. How do we use it? Well, real easy. Like I said, place a cauldron in the world. Whack it with the wand, and you've now got a crucible. Make sure to have a fire source under it. You can either go ahead and light a flame, place some lava, or if you happen to get some nitor already, you can go ahead and get that. But for now, we'll use a flame, because I don't have any nitor. And then, lastly, you're going to need to fill this thing up with some water. Now, the water is going to sit here and uh, start to bubble and boil. That's when you know it's ready to go. Let's see what happens. There it is. Cool. Good job. So once the water is boiling, you can start crafting stuff. Now the recipe for how you use the cauldron uh, or the crucible is right here inside your Thaumonomicon. So let's go with a basic uh, item here. Let's look at nitor. Uh, you know nitor is made in the crucible because it says so over here. You get um, pretty much the same way you did it in Thaumcraft 3, just a little bit different. You still need to look at an item's aspects and toss them into the crucible in the ra ratios. But instead of just hitting it with a wand, you now have to throw a catalyst in. And that's what this represents right here. So basically what you're looking at is you need to get three Potentia, three Ignis, and three Lux. Once you've got all of that in there, you can go ahead and toss in a Glowstone Dust and you'll get Nitor. Cool, right? So let's give it a shot. Um, I happen to know that you can get um, some good stuff from coal. So let's go ahead and scan it real quick. I'm just going to drop some on the ground. There we go. We get two Potentia and Ignis from this. Now, we remember from our Thaumonomicon that we need three of each. So a good thing to do at this point is probably go uh, and double this. So if we put three coal in, we would have six Potentia and six Ignis. So we're going to want to make two Nitor just to have a nice balanced formula here. Okay. So we know we're going to need three coal. Okay. The other thing we're going to need is some Lux, and I happen to know that torches have Lux on them. So we're going to need uh, six Lux in total, so I'm going to get six torches ready to go. Drop them in. And since we're going to be making um, two of these, we're going to want to drop two Glowstone Dust in. Um, we haven't scanned this yet. It's not important to scan it before you drop it in, but hey, like I said, the more scanning you do, the better. Cool. So I think we're ready to toss this stuff in here. Now here's the deal. Once you toss an item into um, the cauldron, keep an eye on what happens. Okay, what's going to happen is it's going to have all the components inside that item, um, you know, sitting in there for a while. But eventually, after a period of time, they're going to start breaking down. The uh, more complex aspects will break down into their basic aspects. And then those basic aspects will boil away into the atmosphere. So don't wait around after dropping your stuff in the cauldron here. Otherwise, you're not going to have a really good time. You're going to um, just wind up uh, with some bad stuff flowing out in the atmosphere. Now, that does go into the atmosphere as tank and some bad effects can happen especially if you overload this cauldron so be very careful when doing alchemy because bad things can happen so let's go ahead and toss in our coal and our torches and then here goes our glowstone dust ta-da 
we've got two nitor. So the glowstone dust acts as the catalyst. It combined the uh, aspects inside the torch and the coal, um, and we wound up with a very nice piece of nitor. And like I said, nitor can be used as a flame source, so no longer do we have to sit down here with this ugly thing. We can go ahead and just place some nitor on the ground, and that will boil our water for us. See? Nice. You'll also note that unlike previous versions, um, you no longer automatically use up all the water in the cauldron. You usually get several uses out of the cauldron before your water completely evaporates. You can go ahead and uh, fill it back up if you want, or you can uh, drain it out like this. You can also um, shift right click to completely clear the cauldron and any remaining aspects that are inside the cauldron will get sent straight into the atmosphere. So if you've overfilled your cauldron or if you just want to like reset it, you know, easy to do, just shift right click with the wand and it clears it out, dumping all the aspects into the environment. Pretty cool. And of final note, these uh, cauldrons are uh, basically liquid containers, so you can pump liquids in here uh, using any liquid pumping mechanic from Buildcraft to whatever else you want. So any way you want to get liquid into a container, feel free to pump it directly in to keep it full of water. Uh, of course, there are golems that will keep it full of water, and we'll get to that in just a bit. All right, guys, let's continue on the theme of how to make stuff by looking at the infusion stuff. Now, um, infusion is similar but a little bit different from what you did in the past with Thalmcraft 3. Uh, you're going to need to build a pretty fancy multi-block structure, and you're going to need to get uh, a couple different items and a couple different types of aspects, and we're going to get into all the details of that right now so that you know how to use the infusion crafting mechanic in Thalmcraft 4. One of the first things you're going to need is a runic matrix. You need to make this in your arcane workbench and it's really not too bad. You're going to need some arcane stone though. Uh, arcane stone is simply eight pieces of stone around any shard. So pick any shard you want, make that in your arcane workbench, and you can see here that it needs a little bit of terra and ignis to make the whole thing work. Once you've got your runic matrix, which you're going to need one of, you're also going to need uh, a couple arcane pedestals. You're probably going to need a handful of these. At the very least, like maybe three or four, but you probably want to get up to at least nine, I want to say for now. Um, then you're also going to need to uh, build your mystical construct. Now this isn't the easiest thing to make, but it looks something like this when it's all done. Okay? You're also going to need 25 of each aspect stored in your wand in order for this thing to work out. So keep that in mind because uh, you're going to need a pretty much a completely full wand. Now let's go ahead and put it together. We're going to need um, some arcane stone bricks, some arcane stone blocks, some arcane pedestals, and a runic matrix. Let me get all that stuff right now. All right, so like I said, you're going to want a multi-block structure. Start off by placing your arcane pedestal in the center. Then you're going to want some arcane stone bricks, which are simply four arcane stone in a vanilla crafting table. So you don't have to do any fancy crafting. Just a regular old crafting table will do for these guys. They're also pretty nice decorations, so you might want to use them to build with. Nothing wrong with that. Arcane stone blocks go on top of each of the arcane stone bricks. And then finally, in the center, one block above your pedestal, you're going to want to place that runic matrix. A good way to do that is just place like a piece of cobblestone or something on top of there, and then break the cobblestone. Now, all you have to do at this point is right click with your wand, and you're going to need 25V of each aspect. Hey, why is it not working? Oh, right. My wand uses an extra cost. Um, you can see the V cost is a little bit high on that. Hmm. Well, that's not good. Uh, note, by the way, that my V cost is now 105%. That's because I get a 5% discount for wearing goggles of revealing. Cool. That's pretty nice. Well, what are my options? Well, I could make a fancier wand, but I'm going to hold off on making a fancier wand just yet. How about I get uh, some thaumaturgist robes and leggings and boots? These guys should all add up and give me a decent discount. Oh good, my V cost is now 100%. And boy, do I look like a pretty nice wizard. Oh yeah. Um, well, how do we make these guys? Ah, it's really not too hard. Let's take a look real quick. Um, I think it's under the enchanted fabric tab. You can see that you just need some enchanted fabric, which is just a little bit of wool and string and a little bit of magic each. Cool. Once you've got the robes on and the glasses, you get a nice little discount on how much a V it costs. Let's see if we can craft this thing now. Hooray, it's working. Also note though that it completely drained my wand, but now we've got an infusion table. Nice. So that's step one. We've got a table, but there's a lot more to do, so let's get to work. So how do we use this table? Well, there's going to be a lot of stuff that you can craft with it. You're going to get very familiar with how it works. Let's choose one of the um, magical tools that are available in Thalmcraft. Axe of the Stream, you're my favorite, so let's go with you. Um, you can see the recipe here shows you that you get an Axe of the Stream if you place one of those Thalmium Axes, which is, uh, you saw how to craft that last episode. You're also going to need some water shards. 
a diamond, and a great wood log. Great wood uh, is trees that spawn in part of world generation in Thomcraft. It's one of the two types of trees that are added to Thomcraft. However, you're also going to need 16 aqua and 8 arbor. Now, I know aqua is a primal aspect, um, but you're not going to be able to get it from your wand. You're actually going to need the aspects in liquid form, and you're also going to need the arbor in liquid form. Let's see how to get that. Um, once we have it ready, we should be able to go. So, how do we get aspects in liquid form? Well, it's really not too hard, and I think it's covered under the alchemy tab. It's Essentia Distillation. Now, you're going to need a couple different things here. First step is you're going to need to get yourself an alchemical furnace. Okay. Once you've got that, you're going to need to get yourself a flux filter and use that flux filter to make yourself an arcane alembic. Okay. You're also finally going to need some warded jars. What this does is it allows you to take items like cobblestone or paper or anything else and boil them down in the arcane alembic, melt them down into their base aspects. So if I were to throw this chiseled sandstone in there, I would wind up with a liquid of four of that, um, the Perdito, three of the Earth, one of the Stone, and one of the Magic, okay? And if I were to throw an Air Shard in there, I would wind up with the liquid of uh, two Air Shards, one Magic, and one Crystal. Uh, you can see all the um, liquids in here. File store eight of each liquid at a time. Now, you also have to have um, analyzed and researched that aspect before you'll know what it's all about. So you can see here, this one's showing an unknown aspect, but this one it knows is Lux. So I haven't discovered this aspect yet through my research, but Lux I have. So now that we've seen how to craft these things, let's go ahead and put them down. Like I said, you're going to want some arcane alembics, and then you're also going to want um, the alchemical furnace. Okay, so you only need one alchemical furnace. Um, you're basically going to probably want to have about three or four, but I think the max you can have is uh, five of these arcane alembics, and they get placed on top of the alchemical furnace. So let's take a look like so. Like I said, five is about the max that you're going to want to have on there. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. Let's take a look at how this works. Like I said, go ahead and toss in some stuff. So we happen to know that we need, for our Axe of the Stream, 16 Aqua and 8 Arbor. Let's see if we can get some. Well, if we look at this, we'll see that Arbor, um, we, there's four of it on wood, so that should be really easy to get. Um, we're also going to want to give this thing a fuel source. It has to use something to melt it down, and any uh, vanilla fuel source will work, like coal, bucket of lava, basically anything that would work in a normal furnace will work. Once it's burned the item down, it turns it into this purple liquid, and then that purple liquid has to be distilled. Once it's finished distilling, it's going to wind up inside these arcane alembics, and if you've got your goggles on, you should be able to see what's inside the alembic and how much. So we can see that we've managed to get exactly eight arbor, no more, no less. So we got the exact amount of aspects that were listed on the oak wood here. Finally, we're going to just need one of those jars. So let's get ourselves a jar. Here we go, warded jar. Once you've placed it down underneath the spout, it's going to go ahead and fill up. And we can see the warded jar here filling up. Beautiful. We got all eight of the arbor aspect and we're ready to break this thing. Don't worry, once you break it, it'll continue to have the arbor aspect inside. You're gonna to wanna to place this near your um, infusion table because it's going to need to be able to draw this liquid aspect out of the jar and straight into the infusion once crafting begins. Let's go ahead and get our water next. Why don't we use water shards here because they happen to have um, three different aspects available to them. So once these things start melting down, we're gonna notice that we get different aspects and different alembics. That's why you're going to want to have the five alembics stacked up here. So once you've gotten enough of these aspects built up, we'll be good to go. Let's wait for everything to drain out and we'll be right back. There we go. We've got eight, eight, and 16. Again, we didn't lose any. And don't worry, you can stack your bottles up just fine like so. There we go. And you'll note here that uh, each of your bottles quickly fill up with the relevant aspects. Cool. So we've got our liquids. Nice. And we're going to hang on to this crystal and magic aspect because you never know. We're probably going to need them at some point in the future. Cool. So the axe of the stream needed 16 aqua and 8 arbor. Do we have that? We do. 16 aqua and 8 arbor. 
Perfect. What else did we need to do? Well, we need to give it um, some of these items. How are we going to do that? Well, that's where the extra arcane pedestals come in. Go ahead and place your arcane pedestals somewhere nearby. And you're going to want to go ahead and place these in an orderly manner. For now, I'm just placing down four. But you might want to place down eight. You might want to place down... Um, Probably eight's about the max you're going to need. Okay, if you do four, you're going to want to make sure it's nice and balanced so that it's across like a parallel line um, from one to the other. And this becomes important a little bit later on. I'll explain it in a moment. I'm actually going to switch it up and put down eight. Let's do that. There we go. Nice, balance, and a good shape. Cool. In order to uh, infuse your items, you're going to have to get every item that you need and want to infuse. Now here's our recommendation. Get a couple extra and bring it with you because bad things can sometimes happen and you might lose the item before it gets infused into the target item. Okay, So the item in the center of this is what goes on the center pedestal. So we're going to need some diamonds, some water shards, and some great wood logs. So to get started is really pretty easy. Just once again, we'll reference our Thaumonomicon and find out that we need one diamond, one great wood log, and two water shards. So the Thaumium Axe goes in the center. Just right click and it'll be placed on top of the pedestal. Okay, we're going to need one diamond, one piece of wood, and two water shards. Cool. We're good to go. In order to kick off this whole thing, go ahead and give it a good hit with your wand. First, you'll note that the liquid aspects will start flowing and infusing into the target item. It's going to drain all the 16 water that it needed, and then the 8 arbor is going to start heading its way in. Then it's going to start breaking down the items. They're going to be destroyed and infused into the table. Uh-oh, I'm getting some tainted effects. That can't be good. Flux taint. Looks like that was pretty easy. And it was. That was one of the easier ones to make. We can see in our Thaumonomicon that the chance for uh, instability is negligible, meaning there's hardly any instability created here. However, some of the more advanced items might have a high level of instability. You can also see that, for example, the Thaumostatic Harness, which allows you to fly, uh, requires quite a lot of liquid aspects and a large number of items surrounding the table. This is why I told you to have eight pedestals ready. Now again, it's important that you go ahead and put um, these pedestals in a nice balanced pattern pattern around the center pedestal, and you should try to balance your items. Note that this item here, the opposite side of it, is over here. And there's a reason that I balance the items like this. If I had placed the items in an unbalanced formula, maybe I'd placed one here and here, and here and here, and not placed these down, this would not be balanced, and there'd be a higher chance of instability, which would lead to some negative effects like taint, items being destroyed, items falling off the pedestals. There's several different taint and uh, instability effects that you want to watch out for. Finally, to help limit the instability effects, you can add all kinds of mystical artifacts. Recommendations include different candles, mixed crystal clusters, which you can find out how to make in your Thaumonomicon, and enemy skulls. These different mystical artifacts will help to reduce the amount of instability. Um, they have a pretty good range as well. I think it's about 10 or 12 blocks that you can place these out from the center of the pedestal, and they'll all help to keep things a little bit more stable. Now let's move on to one of my favorite parts of Thaumcraft the golems. Golems have gotten a major upgrade and are a bit more modular now. You're going to basically need two main components for your golems and an optional third. Let's take a look at what's involved. First off, the golem himself. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different types of golems. Uh, the most basic and simple are straw golems. These are made in a crucible and you simply need to get a few aspects in your crucible and some hay bales. Just toss one in and you'll get yourself a straw golem. So the crucible's alchemy brings life to this golem. You can see his attributes are that he has very low durability and strength. He has an average bit of self-repair. He can only carry one item at a time. His speed is pretty quick, though, and he's allowed one upgrade. And I'll talk about the upgrades in a moment. Um, next up is the wooden golem, again, made in the crucible. And he's going to have below average durability, low strength, average self-repair. He can carry four items at a time, though, and above average speed, and again, one upgrade available. So the different golems have different effects and aspects between their durability and strength, how much they can repair, and how much they can carry. The towel golem is pretty similar to the wooden one, but he gets two upgrades, which is nice. You'll have clay golems that can carry eight items, and again, flesh golems also can carry eight, but have two upgrades. Stone golems can carry 16, but are pretty slow to lumber around. 
Iron golems have a really high strength and durability, but are very slow to self-repair and move, but they can also carry 32 items at a time. And finally, you've got Thaumium golems, which are really pretty good, a bit slow, and allow two upgrades. Pretty nice. So really you want to look at how expensive or how much do you want to spend on your golems with what they're going to be doing. If they're really not going to be carrying much around and you can handle with just one item at a time, go with the straw golems. They're really quick to move around. But if you really want to be able to carry a lot of stuff, stone golems might be the uh, option for you with 16 or even uh, higher up uh, you can go with the iron golems that can carry 32 items at a time. Cool. Now those apply the attributes of the golem, now let's take a look at golem animation cores, of which there are many. These determine what the golems do. For example, the golem animation core of Gather will allow your golem to pick up any items that are placed on the ground nearby and drop them in a chest. And that golem animation core um, is made in a crucible. You just need to get a blank golem animation core, which we can see is an arcane workbench recipe, and then drop it in a crucible with some uh, lucrum and some terra, and it'll turn into a Gather animation core. Pretty nice. You can also get the harvest animation core, which automatically farms. You can get the guarding animation core, which uh, guards your area from enemies. Pretty cool. There's several animation cores that we can take a look at and we'll see in this video. Finally, the upgrades that I was telling you about a moment ago are all listed here. You can see that some upgrades make your golem move faster, while others make them stronger, or um, some will make them more perceptive, which means they can see things from a greater range, uh, and some can be a little bit uh, more organized. For example, the golem upgrade for order um, allows you to specify different colors for blocks marked with the golem answers bell, which I'll get to in a moment. So this gives you more control over your golem. It makes them a little bit more intelligent, if you will. Um, you can also so um, look at your golem animation cores and see if there's anything particularly interesting. Um, an example of this is the harvest core. Um, unfortunately, your harvest golems are not smart enough to replant the crops they have harvested, but you might be able to figure out a way to make that happen. And in this case, it's the order upgrade. The order upgrade, if applied to a harvest golem, allows them to replant the crops as they're harvesting. So go ahead and make sure to pay attention to your golem animation core pages, especially once you've um, researched and discovered certain things like the upgrades because you might just find that your golems get different abilities when given different golem upgrades. So let's start playing with some of these golems. Typically you're going to want to attach a golem to some kind of inventory. I'm going to place this straw golem I have. Remember it's the most basic straw golem and uh, when I right click him on the chest he'll kind of just sit there looking a little bit dead. That's because he doesn't have an animation core hooked up to him yet so he really can't do much. However if I place my gather animation core on him this will wake him up. Hey there buddy, how's it going? You can open up his interface and specify exactly what kind of items to pick up, but leaving it blank means he'll pick up everything. Let's go ahead and drop a few items on the ground. I dropped three pieces of cobble. Let's see what happens. Oh, looks like he can only pick up one at a time. Well, that's not good. Well, that's kind of what we expected though. He's just a straw golem after war. He really can't carry too much stuff. Now, if you want to get him back, you have one of two options. First off, you're going to need to get yourself a Golemancer's Bell. Really pretty simple to make, just a stick and some nether quartz and an arcane workbench. Okay? Now, um, the Golemancer's Bell has several different functions. Uh, first off, we're going to want to go ahead and left click him, and that will pick him up just as he is. Note that the Golem still has his animation core attached. And if I place him back down, he's still going to pick up items. However, if you shift left click with the Golemancer's Bell, it will knock off the upgrade as well as the Golem. He no longer has his animation core, so you can see here that he's no longer got his animation core, and he's just a basic simple Golem again without a core. Now at this point I could attach another core to him if I wanted to. Let's try out a better Golem. I'm going to place down the wooden Golem here, who can move four items at a time. And I'm going to place eight pieces of cobblestone on the ground. He should be able to get four at a time and place it in this chest. Thanks buddy, way to go. So you can see how the stronger and better golems can do more work and do it a better job at it. Let's open up his interface and we can specify to only pick up cobblestone. This way we'll make sure that he never picks up any other items like paper. Of course removing that filter will allow him to once again pick up the paper. Let's try a different type of golem animation core. Let's go ahead and specify the fill animation core. Well, that sounds like fun. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and place this golem right here. And we're gonna tell him to keep this inventory full. 
There you are. Cool. What do you want me to keep here, Master? Either a precise amount or any amount. I'm going to go with any amount, and I'm going to tell him to keep cobblestone in here. But he doesn't really know where to get the cobblestone from. He could have picked it up off the ground, maybe? Hmm, let's see if he does that. Nope, he's not a gathering golem. He's going to have to get it from an inventory. What if I just place it in an inventory nearby? Can he get the cobblestone from here? Doesn't look like it. However, we can tell him to do that by right-clicking on him with the golem bell. You'll note that once you right-click on him, it'll specify his home inventory location. This is where he's attached to. It also tells you what side he's attached to, which is very important because different blocks that accept different items into different slots from different sides will respect this. So if you place him on the top, it's different from placing it on the side. We can go ahead then and right click on the chest that we want him to collect cobblestone from. He will now go ahead and pick up the cobblestone four at a time because he's a wood golem, and keep that chest full of cobblestone at all times. Bringing up your bell again will allow you to see everywhere he's been. You can right click again to remove that location so he no longer picks up items from it. You can also click the F key on your keyboard to clear all saved locations. You can also specify multiple locations. So if we were to put, for example, four cobble in here, and we'll put the other 12 in here. He now knows that he can pick up from both locations, and once he's run out from this location, he'll set over to the other one. The next column I want to introduce you guys to is the one labeled empty. Let's give this a shot. He's going to empty this chest. You'll notice the first thing he does is grab any item out of the chest, but I really only want him to empty this chest of cobblestone. So let's go ahead and place some cobblestone in his filter here, and then we can go ahead and see that he's going to drop the paper and put the cobblestone in his hand. Awesome. Good job, little guy. Now, here's the deal. I can go ahead and specify exactly which side to place that cobblestone on. Simply right-click him and tell him where to put it. I'm going to place it on the top of the furnace, which means he'll inject it into the top of the furnace there like so, and that's going to keep cobblestone in the furnace. Boy, I really wish I could get him to bring coal over here, but even if I had him put coal in, he couldn't put it in the same spot, could he? Probably not. Oh wait, I have an idea. Let's clear this with F. I'm going to bring this cobblestone back, and I'm going to upgrade him with, let's see, I'm going to use the order upgrade, which improves organization and intellect. Now he's got a little bit of an extra option up here. I'm going to specify that anything labeled white, you should put cobblestone in, and anything labeled orange, you should probably put some coal in. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. If we come over here, we can right-click once, and that'll specify any items go on the top. But if we right-click again, you'll notice that the color on the top here is white. That means he's only going to place white items in the top. If I wanted to, I could go down here and set the bottom to orange. Then anything that's set to the orange tab will go into the bottom of the furnace. Ta-da! Way to go, Gollum. Again, right-click to cycle through the different colors. F will completely clear everything, or shift right click to remove that symbol altogether. Some days it just feels like there's no end to what a golem can do for you. Thanks, buddy. And believe me, I know what you're thinking. I hope there's a golem that can handle this for me. Don't worry, there is. He's called the Alchemy Golem. There you go, buddy. Let's go ahead and burn up some stuff. There you go. Don't worry, you don't have to click each individual jar. He'll remember if there's jars next to each other, that he should probably put them in a nearby jar, as long as they're adjacent to one that he's hooked up to. Golems have gotten a few more tricks up their sleeves in the latest version of Thomcraft, like this one, who can chop down trees for you. There he goes. Nice. Thanks. 
You can see he's even smart enough to start chopping from the top. Beautiful. These golems are unfortunately not smart enough to replant the trees that they uh, chop down, but you'll definitely want to get somebody to gather all this uh, chopped down wood, and there's probably a golem that can even possibly replant. If you use the use animation core, you can specify exactly what items to use. I'm going to tell them to use these things, and we're going to use it on a block or on any empty space. We'll go with block, and we'll put the oak saplings in the chest. We can specify exactly which block for him to place it down on. Right there, for example. Thanks, and he'll right click it for me. Beautiful. Now once the tree grows, this guy will chop it down. We could probably have another golem picking up the items, placing them in this chest, and then this golem will replant the tree for us. And we can have them plant in multiple locations. Don't worry if he runs out of saplings, he'll get a few more. And with that, guys, I think we've hit a good wrapping up point for part two of Thomcraft 4's Mod Spotlight. Hope you've enjoyed it so far. I haven't quite covered everything that I want to cover, so we're going to have to come back in part three. Uh, today's episode, you saw all kinds of cool stuff like infusion crafting, how to use the crucible, and the amazing things that golems can do. And believe me, I've only covered about half of the golem animation cores, so we have a lot more that you can do. But we're going to go on in part three and check out some other aspects of Thalmcraft. We're going to see um, how you can move nodes around. We're going to see some upgraded wands, maybe even a a couple more of the wand um, cores that I really like and then we're going to move on to some of the taint effects and what you can expect to find in the world if you abuse magic just a little bit and maybe even how to fix that up. So for now this is Direwolf20 signing off on the spotlight of Thalmcraft 4. Hope you have enjoyed it and take it easy!